Malik came out very strongly that it is going to disrupt the market completely. It's not been the case. We are at hardly 7-8% in the two-wheeler uh, two penetration. Yeah, and we are maybe 3 or 4 percent in the 4 wheel. If you see the biggest uh, player in the automobile space, which is Toyota, which has 50 percent market share in passenger vehicles, globally. Even globally, globally. Yeah. And they are saying that even we do not know which is the next battery. They have not gone into 100 percent into yeah. EV yet. Hybrid they is where uh, their focus is on. Hi everyone, today we are in Mumbai with a 600 crore market cap company. It's been a while since we've done a company in the automotive space. Today we are with Remsons Industries. They are into control cables and they are going into several other divisions as well. Today we are joined by Rahul Kejriwal, a third generation entrepreneur and the executive director of the company. Hello sir, thank you very much for the good morning. So firstly I want to directly get into the subject about the industry, automotive. Can you explain the entire value chain? Value chain meaning I'm, it might sound a, a bit too much, but what I'm looking at is what are the main components that goes into like cars like let's say Wagner or Land Cruiser for example and what are the main raw materials that goes into uh, vehicles, cars especially? So in the automotive sector, uh, the value chain is broken down into forms of commodity forms like you know you have the chassis, you have the electricals, you have electronics. So that's how they break it down uh, into proprietary, non-proprietary commodities. That's how it's broken down. So, for example, you would have uh, the entire body, so which would come as the sheet metal entire body. Then you have the chassis, then you have the electronics, the electricals, engine parts, proprietary. Proprietary means that, that the design is the responsibility of the supplier themselves and it's a proprietary technology of the design. So, you have and then you have the uh, a lot of uh, commodity buyings like tires, batteries, um, windows, um, I mean, glass. So it's broken down into a, you know, a subdivided and that's how the purchasing of this takes place. Now, uh, where does Remsen's industry come into this entire value chain? So traditionally our products come under the chassis system where, you know, we do manufacture control cables. So everything is hidden uh, into the chassis, they're rooted through the chassis, all, all across hidden. Uh, we are moving from a chassis part and in our products are proprietary products as well. So the design, the onus of design, the responsibility, the performance is uh, is on us. You know, we have to uh, prove that and we have to come up with different technologies to enhance the performance uh, of the products. Uh, like the companies would just give us uh, a black box design saying, that, okay, we want connection A to connection B and this is how it's going to go. And you propose how your cable should be designed. And that's where we come into the picture. Right from the start, we've been a design house for control cables for the OEMs. Okay. Now we are trying to get into the inside of the vehicle. So still, you know, we, we through uh, our acquisitions, we've got into sensors, we've got into pedal boxes, we've got into winches, uh, jacks. So we are, you know, getting into a more a larger portfolio, going inside the vehicle, like the pedals are obviously visible inside the vehicle, mm -hmm. going into more tech products like infotainment systems, USB chargers, speaker systems, reverse cameras. So that way we are trying to get into the where a person will be able to touch, feel the part uh, uh, itself. Okay. So you, what you're trying to say is before these products were invisible because it used to go under the JC. You would just see a knob lever or something where you would pull. For example, if you had to open your hood, okay. you'd just see a lever which you, you pull and you open the hood or you open the boot okay. or you pull the handbrake. When you pull the handbrake, you can't see the cable. But now from an invisible part, we're coming to a more visible part of the way. So your primary business is or was uh, control cables. And now you shifters, shifters as well. Shifters. Okay. And now you're going into pedals, brakes, sensors through like inorganic and yes. uh, maybe inorganic acquisitions, mergers. Yeah. Okay. Now then let's split it up. Let's take the initial business for now. Uh, control cables. Can you explain what are control cables? It's a single term, right? Yeah. There are power cables, control cables. Yeah. So in this case, what is control cables in very simple terms? So our cables are mechanical control cables. So uh, when you uh, want to open the hood of a vehicle, uh, you pull the lever. So the lever is operated by a cable which goes to the lock mechanism of the hood. Mm -hmm. Similarly for the tailgate or the fuel flap. They're all levers uh, and they go through a cable mechanism onto the lock mechanism. Uh, similarly for door locks, uh, seat lumbar supports, 
uh, then you've got the parking brake lever which you pull and the two cables go to the brake drums uh, then you've got uh, the gear shifter uh, so from a mechanical traditional lot link kit system away in 2000 we were the first to introduce in india uh, gear shifted cables so you know it, it gave a much smoother application it gave the the ability for the designer of the vehicle to position his gearbox anywhere in the engine compartment okay because traditionally the, the gearbox had to be straight in line with the gear sh shifts stick because there used to be a rod lever which goes straight now with the cables you could place anywhere and the cables could take a turn and go anywhere and even the noise vibration hardness was reduced because it, there was a lot of dampening put into it so when uh, right in the year 2000 was way ahead of the industry you know traditionally we've always been way ahead of the industry whether in terms of control cables uh, friction free cables uh, whatever product we introduce has been always uh, at least five ten years ahead of the industry wonderful does it change if it's an automatic uh, gear shift or a manual gear shift? manual gear shifts has got two cables mm -hmm. and automatic gear shifts have got one cable because you just go pdr uh, n or something now it's gone into electronics so you just have the uh, server assemblies on the gearbox and by the press of a button you can change it okay so meaning the involvement of control cables would reduce if it is uh, if it's electronic yes okay now the shifter mechanism would stay mm -hmm. but uh, that also depends you know now like for example the high-end cars have moved just to a knob sometime because you don't really need a shifter for uh, for electronics you can just do it by buttons itself so, like um, from what I have understood, these control cables are present from the bicycles. From like, let's say, if I hang, hang on to a brake, you can clearly see that wire becoming more tensed and getting onto the brakes, whichever brakes they use. So, bicycle is one. Helicopters, the ejection button, apparently, it is from control cables. Even in aircrafts, there's a lot of application of uh, control cables. So, I'm glad that you mentioned the areas that you, you know, supply to in. Uh, control cables now that is understood and then the second part the new business areas you're going into uh, first you had mentioned I think sensors so what is your gameplay there so sensors um, so a lot of cars today are getting into more and more technology uh, savvy you know so they require sensors everything requires a sensor today a lot of our products also require sensors for example the electronic battery box assembly or electronic um, parking brake assembly so they would also require some sensors. So we were looking to uh, integrate sensors into our products, into our product range that we are offering. So that's where our search started to either buy the sensor or find a company that could that we could acquire to you know have that technology in house. And when we searched to uh, buy sensors of the market, it was a very difficult uh, fit coming in. And when we got the opportunity to have a company that uh, we could have uh, you know make sensors to our look and feel and taste and you know uh, application we said that's best because there are so many changes that every oem wants and so we are not dependent on external sources to supply us whether they are technology compliant or not compliant we have our own uh, in-house manufacturing of sensors now okay. and sensors per se becomes an open uh, line itself so it's not just supplying to us that would be a very small percentage of supplies but the majority would be for multiple applications uh, in a vehicle uh, for multiple sectors in the industry you know it's used everywhere is it most like more like a software rather than a hardware? no there is a, there is a hardware a company with the software i oh, got it got it now which like you've acquired a company recently in yeah, sensors company, uh, pune based again called union automation uh, they were supplying to various sectors uh, uh, right from aerospace to the automotive sector so we have acquired the automotive business section of this automotive and uh, off highway business section uh, of this, and we formed a new company, Remsen's uh, Uni Automics Private Limited. Okay. So we hold the majority stake in that company. Hmm. So it's a subsidiary now. It's a subsidiary. Okay. And when did that happen? This financially? Uh, it happened as of the first of May. The first of May. So meaning revenues from that would be it included is. us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like how then break that down? Like uh, how, how what growth are you seeing in that sensor market, especially in that company going forward? So that company has got its own revenue uh, from the automotive sector that we will be getting from the first May onwards consolidating into our balance sheet. But the potential that we see from that company would be doubling the revenue every year for the next two or three years, at least, you know. 
we've already uh, inquired, uh, uh, got inquiries. If I put in value terms, would be at least three or four x the current value of uh, of their uh, revenue. Now we are trying to see where we can, how we can fit that in to you know give us that. Uh, but everything will start coming in from next year. Okay, then can I ask you how much is the current revenue of that company? Current revenue of that company would be the auto sector that we were about twenty crores. Twenty crores. Okay. Wow. Nice. And then so sensors is one. Then infotainment. I think uh, the company name is Daishi. Daishi yeah. So, how, how do you plan to play the uh, infotainment space? So, uh, when you look at Daichi, infotainment is the first thing that comes to mind. But they do a lot more other than infotainment also. Okay. okay. Uh, infotainment being the most complex of their offerings and the most, uh, uh, what I would say, difficult of the offerings uh, with an OEM because, you know, it's a very personalized uh, offering. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, they do a lot of other stuff like uh, high-end speakers. Uh, which are already fitted into they do the Meridian speakers which are already fitted into the Land Rovers mm. uh, in Europe. Uh, they also do uh, reverse cameras, uh, USB chargers. So we are looking at offering uh, starting those products first uh, into India. We've already got some inquiries from OEM. We are already working on that. Infotainment is already happening. Uh, so we are looking at infotainment also from a two-wheeler segment point of view. The digital cluster. Mm. You know, uh, Daichi as a company uh, never looked at the two-wheeler segment because two-wheeler predominantly is a very Asian uh, product. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the first time we have engaged with them on a two-wheeler uh, uh, cluster. Okay. Uh, so having said that, we are doing all the product ranges we have offered to the OEMs. We are seeing what can materialize the first. You know, it doesn't have to be the infotainment. It could be a various array of their product offerings mm -hmm. that we start with. Infotainment is the longest lead time because you know it has to be synced in with their entire vehicle um, architecture, the look, feel, everything you know. But it's a product that we will get to eventually. The approval and everything takes time, like you said, it's very two or three years, uh, two or three years at least uh, before any kind of input. Infotainment would be at least three or four years out. Okay. But the other products could be uh, maybe a year or two into uh, into uh, into production. Infotainment. If you're you're targeting two wheelers to begin with, uh, also okay. Yes. Also or pr primarily two wheelers. What is no, it? No, also. Also okay. That's fine. Because I was thinking, if a uh, let's say Ola electric vehicle is being sold at one lakh twenty thousand, then what value will that infotainment have? It's See, those are very small digital clusters mm -hmm. which come into there. Okay, because you remember in two wheeler, uh, space is a constraint, weight is a constraint. And uh, it's it's open, so you can't have really um, sound music and all coming out of that because you can't hear anything in the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So what you assume as an infotainment cluster of a four wheeler is just a digital cluster when it comes to a two wheeler. Mm -hmm. You add some more features into there, but uh, it's not a full blown infotainment system uh, in a two wheeler. Okay. Now the uh, the pedals, the brakes, the other part of the business. I think you are done uh, acquisition a couple of years ago. I think 2020. 20. Magal Magal cables. cables yeah. Yes, you had acquired. So how did that pan out? Because the reason is in twenty in uh, financial year twenty, they you had bought it for around thirty five crore rupees, and then uh, that time they were doing like eighty five crore top line, and now it is just there, maybe seventy crore they're doing even after four years. I want to ask you why is this the case? First and secondly, is this even profitable? Because uh, UK, a lot of companies we have, meaning we have we have seen companies that did wrong acquisition in the UK, uh, acquired the debt as well, and the and then the listed company also went bankrupt. So I'm, I want to ask you: Is it com is the company profitable? And uh, like, what are the margins there? If you can give numbers. So let's start uh, from the first part of the question: Is we acquired this company when uh, so Magal Cables was part of a larger, much larger conglomerate group of companies called the Arlington Group. Okay. The Arlington Group went into bankruptcy at that point of time. So they had various companies into various geographical sectors of the of the globe. And um, you know they broke them down into small companies and they started spending the small companies. Okay. So we bought a portion of that uh, called Magal Cables in 2020. You know, like most at, especially during COVID time, where most of the companies were playing very safe. We decided to go out and do an acquisition at that point of time. Uh, you know, it was a very bold step, uh, a very ambitious step to take at that point of time. Uh, we did our vetting of the accounts and we did our vetting of uh, everything. And um, 
so so far the journey has been very good uh, we've had uh, it's been profitable all throughout yeah. okay uh, and you, uh, like you said you know the revenue part of it so they had a lot of intercompany revenue at that point of time so when they broke it up and set it up all up it became an independent company so all that inter, uh, intercompany revenue kind of stopped at that point of time so uh, we got marquee customers from there like uh, Ford Global Business, we got uh, JLR uh, Global Business, we got Daimler Business. So we got a good uh, business acquisition from there. We got some of the products that we are not doing. Like they were also doing cables but they were also doing pedal boxes, winches, jacks. So now we have taken the winches from there and we localized it in India uh, for the Indian markets. They are continuing. We have never cannibalized their sales by bringing it to India. You know? We always wanted the footprint over there and it to run profitably over there which they are still doing uh, like uh, the winches we uh, launched over four of Tata's models uh, in India and we plan to take this into various other uh, models for various other OEMs into India as well okay. pedal boxes is where they are doing and we are now planning to get into the that's where the sensor company comes into play mm -hmm. where we do the electronic pedal box through sensors and stuff you know so you integrate the sensors into the pedal boxes and going from a mechanical pedal box what they were actually doing okay. into a more ele electronic pedal box. Electronic pedal box. So uh, traditionally the accelerator pedals used to be you know there would be a pedal and a cable attached which would release a few. So many years back what has happened is it's, it's just a, a wire that goes in. So there's an electronic uh, sensor over there which uh, senses the position of the pedal and releases the fuel accordingly which is within, within nanoseconds. So there's no efficiency loss in terms of fuel. Uh, so having said this, Magar always had the uh, mechanical part of it, uh, but they never had the electronic part of it. Now we are integrating electronic part of it uh, into it. They also have the brake and uh, clutch pedal uh, box, which still stays manual. Okay. So, but the accelerator stays. Accelerator goes to electronic. Okay. Is there any cars in India with this model? All of them. All of them. Okay. All. So, Electronic uh, throttles, electronic accelerators has been the norm for the last, uh, I would say, at least 10 or 15 years. Okay, but the brake and the clutch? So, brakes are uh, have always been uh, manual, okay. uh, hydraulic uh, operation. So, it's just a pedal. There's no cable attached to the brake. And the clutch also, uh, a lot of cars have gone hydraulic. Mm -hmm. There used to be a clutch cable, you know, very few cars now use clutch cables. Yes. But that's already transitioned into hydraulics. Mm -hmm. But a certain cars still use uh, clutch cables. So what I'm sensing is that uh, the because things are moving from mechanical to a bit more automated, uh, the number of control cables, can I say that will reduce eventually? But at the same time, because you've got these acquisitions on the right side, uh, be, that is going into like infotainment, more automatic and uh, electronic areas, that a part of the business that you might lose in the future from control cables. Assuming that you don't go into any other industry, assuming that you keep supplying to the current, uh, uh, you know, current companies, the right hand side, which is a new acquisition, will make up for the loss. Okay, so I'll break this down further down for you. Okay, um, <clears throat> EV has been a dis disruption in the in the segment today, mm -hmm. as all know it. Okay, while it came out very strongly that EV is going to disrupt the market completely, it's not been the case. We are at hardly 7-8% in the two-wheeler uh, two penetration uh, and we are maybe 3 or 4% in the four-wheeler penetration. Commercial uh, side, we see no penetration whatsoever. Or, or they are making some amends, but that's very, very small, very far-fetched today. From a four-wheeler standpoint, uh, most of the OEMs have said by 20, 30 uh, or 35, there would be only 30% of the vehicles which will be fully EV. So still 70% would still be using ICE engines and still the same kind of uh, uh, revenue in terms of cables and all will continue. Mm -hmm. uh, even in a EV uh, vehicle, uh, all your body cables and all continue to be the same. Mm -hmm. They don't change. In fact, uh, what happens from a fuel flap uh, for becomes a, uh, you know, where you plug in your uh, yeah. charging port, so it becomes a charge port flap. The nomenclature has changed, the cable is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. We are already supplying charge port flaps and all for the PSA Citron models. That have been launched in India. Which ones? The PSA Citron okay. model, uh, which has been launched uh, in India, and they're also exported to Brazil and uh, South America. We're already supplying uh, all the EV components. We're already supplying all the EV cables to uh, Tata Nexon. So we're there as in terms of EVs uh, cables supply, so the EVs are concerned. Mm -hmm. We're designing them also for them. Mm -hmm. uh, on the two-wheeler side, 
uh, you'll see a bit reduction in cables, but the brake cables continue to be uh, mechanical because of the safety uh, part of it. And they form the larger value add uh, amongst the cable basket to the two wheeler. Okay. Even if two wheeler uh, over the next maybe eight, 10 years, it'll take a long while for even that to transition into a sizable percentage of uh, EV. Mm -hmm. And so the business from a, from a, from a, if I look at it from a 10 year perspective, the business is quite protected in that way in terms of EV, the store transition. But before that, you know, we've already taken the step to, you know, get more electronics, get more. So all our businesses now that we have got, whether it is sensor, whether it is infotainment, whether it is a JV for tire inflation uh, kit, they're all um, fuel agnostic. Okay. Irrespective of the fuel, it's going to be used and it's going to be there. That was my next question. Because a lot of transitions happening in the... Uh, yeah. So, our, our strategy is being fuel agnostic. Got it, got it. And even this transition, even though people have high sentiments towards it, it does take time. It just takes a long time. There are a lot of challenges in it, uh, especially uh, the summer, the battery performance, the summer times, the availability of um, you know, charging stations, the society laws of installing charging stations in complexes, buildings and all. So, I mean, it's, it's going to all work out. But not in the next, it can't happen in two, three years. You know, it's not, it can't happen so quickly. Absolutely. Like if you see the biggest uh, player in the automobile space, which is Toyota, which has 50% market share in passenger vehicles, globally. even globally, globally. Yeah. And they are saying that even we do not know which is the next battery. They have not gone into 100% into no. EV yet. Hybrid they, is where their uh, their focus is on. Exactly. Because they, are, they do not know which battery is going to come. Recently, uh, a TDK a company, battery company, they came up, so they basically manufacture batteries for these mics, AirPods, and all these things. They came up with a new material called solid state battery, which can like 10x the battery capacity. So a lot of evolution is happening. New element is coming. So anode, cathode, and the electrolyte in between. So they're trying different chemistries. The different chemistries are giving good results. I think Toyota has committed that we'll come up with solid state batteries in a, in a two or three years they're going to be coming up with. So this is a slow progress rather than overnight shift. So even in the mobile phones if you started, you know, when you had the nickel height batteries to start with and the lithium ion came in much longer, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's stabilized over a, over a fair bit of time. Even in this you'll have a fair bit of hits and trials on the batteries. It will stabilize within some and technology is changing so fast, you know. You have to come up with new and new ways to. Uh, that's the only way they'll be able to differentiate their vehicle from another vehicle. You know? mm -hmm. If they can offer something better, better range, a lower weight, uh, better battery life, you know, faster charging times, something is going to give way. You know? Absolutely. Now I want to slightly shift uh, the current business. Uh, you you're giving you know you're doing you're expecting to do like a three x growth in the next three to four years. Before that, if I check the, go through the current results, uh, financially 24, when the uh, OEMs, like let's say your clients have grown, let's say Maruti Suzuki, uh, Mahindra and Mahindra, Tata Motor, these are the beasts, beasts in the in OEM industry. They are growing by maybe 12%, 13% on aggregate, while uh, Remsen's hasn't grown. I, hmm. I would uh, So we've grown uh, uh, three times over the last six years, you, you know, okay, the few CR uh, history, yeah. uh, and our projection is three times uh, another three x jump in the next three years. Yeah. Okay, uh, from last year to this year, yeah. we our focus was on um, improving uh, uh, margins yeah. of the business. Uh, like you see, we may not have grown the top line, mm -hmm. but we've grown the bottom line. Uh, that was a conscious strategy to change the product mix a bit, to work up, to have the ability to go out for further acquisitions and um, you know, takeovers and stuff like this, where we wanted to get into more technology products. So we needed uh, the stability of the, uh, the mothership mm -hmm. to be there. Okay, uh, a lot of our projects which started, uh, which was supposed to start last year, is going to start this year. Okay. So from middle of this year, we're going to see a lot of projects uh, starting up and uh, giving, uh, helping the revenue basket of things. Uh, so. 20, may say second half from uh, 24, 25 and the full year of 25, 26, you're going to see the actual fruits of the last two, three years of efforts that have gone into, you know, getting the business, getting the projects into the business. The pipeline that was built is now coming to a fruition 
from the second half of this year. Second half of FY25. Okay. And that would be mostly inorganic or new acquisitions. No, no. So what I'm going to say is uh, from the cable side, there's a lot of organic growth that's going to happen. Uh, uh, organic growth in terms of domestic and export organic growth uh, in terms of manufacturing and uh, of cables. And of course, the inorganic business that is going to also help. We've already done, like you said, the sensors and a couple of JVs, but we're also looking at a couple of more uh, products that we're going to have the inorganic expansion within this year itself. Now, now, like that's the past, now future, you did cover a bit of it. Uh, if you are planning, you, your public statement, like what you've said, is that you plan to size up the 300 crore top line to around 900 to 1000 crores in the next uh, four years. years, three years, four years, four years by financial year 28. So can you, and that's a huge jump and it's not going to be easy to deliver, but how do you break that up into like inorganic or organic? Because just to extend, if it's completely taking debt, issuing new equity and completely just acquiring companies, then it's an easy way out. But can you break it up like into inorganic and organic? So inorganic would, uh, so, okay, organic would be 50% of that turnover and inorganic would be 50% of that turnover. Okay. Organically, you would not be able to get that kind of growth uh, so fast uh, coming in. So we're looking at uh, inorganic growth. Uh, we're looking at different geographies for inorganic growth because we want to be present in a lot of geographies uh, at the same time. So 50% of our uh, roadmap would be through uh, inorganic acquisitions. Uh, and then once you acquire them, it all becomes part of the organic uh, system. You know? Like for example, when you acquire the UK, you know, it's part of our organic, uh, when we talk, it's part of our system. Maybe next year when we talk about sensors, it'll become part of our organic uh, structure. Sorry, I was just doing the math. So if 50% growth means if let's say 300 to 900, that's a 600 crore dif differential. So 600 crore, 50% means. No. And I'm saying when you take the total 900, yeah. about 450 okay. to 500 would be the cables part of it and the rest would be in organic. Okay, understood. That makes sense. Uh, then um, I want to come into the the tire deflator. That's something that we didn't speak. So you have the, the mothership, like you termed it, the uh, control cables, then the new areas that is like let's say subsidiaries and joint ventures you've got the sensors infotainment and you got the tire inflator so so about the tire inflator we did not speak about it it's it, you acquired a company mm -hmm. called it's a joint venture joint venture okay so revenues from there won't be coming revenues from there won't be coming the bottom line will be coming what like i try to understand the concept it's a swiss company swiss technology no. Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, you can say it's a German company, okay. manufacturing plant in Poland okay. uh, and China. Okay. And uh, India would be one of their next uh, bases for uh, manufacturing and assembly. Uh, so let's talk about tire mobility here. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically a small compressor mm -hmm. with a sealant bottle which fits onto the compressor. You can use the compressor standalone or with the sealant bottle. So when you have a puncture in the tire, uh, stranded on the expressway or a highway or somewhere you can fit it it goes into your uh, uh, 12 volt uh, charger into the into the vehicle and it fits into the uh, the tire uh, inflator part of the tire you on it and the air goes in and the chemical goes in okay it will inflate the tire plus seal all the punctures into the tire okay so within 15 minutes you can you know, up and going you know. so the chemical will uh, fix the ruptured bit yeah. And the air will, of, of course, inflate once that rupture is yeah. resolved. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, is this right that this process, this new process, will take around 15 minutes? 15 minutes, maximum. While the new, while the old traditional method of fixing the tire, provided that you know how to do it, yeah. it takes around 30, 35 yeah, minutes. So, you know, when you're stuck in a, in a place and you're late for a meeting or you're going somewhere, you don't, fun, it's a very messy process. Uh, second, it doesn't happen sometimes. You know, the nuts on both also will not move. Because of the heat that's generated, the car's already hot, it's been running at time, there's expansion all over the place. You know, you have to tighten it properly, you remove it, you know, everything gets very dirty and stuff. And uh, a lot of times the spare wheel does not have the adequate air pressure also mm -hmm. to run the vehicle. You know, you're still standard even after replacing the spare wheel. So this way, uh, when you use it as an inflator, you can inflate the tire anytime, anywhere you want. And if there's a small puncher, you fix it, you can run it for the whole day, you can run it for days together before you even get to a repair shop. 
and if it's a major rupture then you know it will at least give you the ability to get to a repair shop in time okay so your contribution is jv would look the the what do you say the chemical and the intellectual properties owned by them yes and yours would be like distribution new market you're giving it to them so we are uh, two parts of it yes of course uh, the marketing activities uh, fall under our uh, purview mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also uh, we are putting the assembly line in our factory uh, for the assembly kit of it okay. uh, that will stay with us uh, the patented chemical that comes in will always be with it and uh, okay so that's about the aircom group uh, JV that you have for tire inflation. So, is, have I covered all the new areas of growth? Or yes, absolutely. So that's all. That's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. We're talking of a couple of more that are not in the public domain so far, mm -hmm. which are in the due diligence stages, which are in the ne negotiation stages, mm -hmm. which hopefully by uh, the fourth September we should be able to announce them as well. Got it. Now you said like uh, from what I understand. Uh, you term yourself as a company that is catering to the entire uh, spectrum of vehicles in the control cable space. Yes. Whether it's two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler, tractors, agriculture, uh, commercial yes. vehicles, sorry. And uh, is there any other sector that you plan to go into or any other sector that I did not mention? So we are already doing the railway sector. Okay. Uh, we are not supplying directly to the railways, okay. but we are supplying it through uh, companies that do supply to the railways. Okay, uh, because that's how the product goes into the railways, you know, uh, they don't buy the, the cables directly uh, uh, because of how it's fitted. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, even the defense sector, uh, uh, we supply to the OEMs who make the specialized vehicles for the defense. Uh, and so, you know, we are present, uh, our products are fitted into the defense sector uh, automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, even internationally, our products have been fitted into the defense uh, vehicles mm -hmm. uh, through uh, OEMs. So we are present into the railways and the defense sectors uh, by default. Uh, yeah. Got it. Now let me just and uh, break, try to break up this value chain. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So there are let's say railways. You mentioned railways first. Uh, the government gives tenders uh, to manufacture one day Bharat trains or whatever trains uh, to let's say Titaga wagons, Jupiter wagons, and then the Jupiter wagons when they manufacture these wagons. You supply to them yeah. these countries. You supply maybe not the, num the names you mentioned, okay. but we would supply to uh, these companies who would then be supplying to the railways. Understood. No, these are just examples yeah. just to make uh, yeah. audience can understand. Then let's say in the defense again, I'm not asking who do you supply to directly, but uh, let's say a Bharat Forge or a Mahindra or um, a Force Motors, they must be uh, manufacturing these vehicles for the. Uh, for the armed forces yeah, supply so you supply to them yeah. okay not directly to not defense directly. but indirectly yeah. through the OEMs and yeah. okay understood uh, then uh, so you've spoken about the growth we've spoken about the industry now a couple of uh, you know bookkeeping questions uh, first firstly like uh, the control cable space okay before going to bookkeeping sorry uh, this control cable is it becoming a saturated market with a lot of new players entering and what do you see is the next upcoming threat in this space so it has always been a saturated market there are already seven eight players um, present in india into the control cable space mm -hmm. and there are further growing only yeah okay. uh, because of the high level of volume and demand if i break this up then there are uh, segments of the industry mm -hmm which is purely price competitive. Mm -hmm. There are segments of the, uh, of the industry which is uh, purely focused on engineering uh, and price. And uh, there are segments which is purely a performance based uh, engineering uh, methods. You know. uh, that's how the segment is broken up. The maximum number of competitors would be where the, it's price sensitive. Because the entry barrier is just price at that point of time. Where uh, they require rock solid engineering, manufacturing, knowledge of materials, knowledge of performance is where the players start to reduce mm -hmm. and that's where we play the bridge between the uh, people who do just the price for yeah. uh, uh, versus the people who uh, who are into high end technology the global firms where we are able to bring a technology at the right price for the OEMs mm -hmm. no i've seen like there are a lot of unorganized players in india and same time there's companies like honeywell that does uh, but honeywell again is electronic yeah. electrical so they, they are a lot of companies uh, globally uh, which do uh, uh, control cables. Uh, but 
they don't do the price uh, sensitive cables like like i said you now we come into a fit where we are able to provide the technology at the correct price maybe not at the cheapest price but at the correct price got it so there is threat but then because of the engineering many capabilities yes. and able to bridge that gap between price and uh, the you know technological aspect of it you able to stay in the market yes. fit okay now the bookkeeping question i would ask you you recently did a fundraise and fundraise let me understand the process you are raising capital so that you can acquire companies through acquisition going into new areas through that new areas you are trying to reach a 900000 crore top line Correct. so now coming to the base you raised uh, funds recently and uh, considering that there is a cash in recently you have a cash of around 48 crores but at the same time you have a short term borrowing of 45 crore on which you're paying like let's say 13 to 15% interest no, that's very high we don't pay that kind of interest okay so uh, yeah so we have uh, uh, debt like some working capital debt and some short term loans which is as debt what we've done is we've taken the cash reserve and put it in a fixed deposit okay, okay. so we are setting off the interest of the um, a large part of the interest uh, through uh, this thing the reason for doing this is that that's cash readily available for us to invest mm -hmm. because if we have to you know, if we pay off all our debt and we try to raise further debt the process is very long Mm -hmm. so the we've kept it in in a fluid state so when we see an opportunity we're able to go go after it in the shortest possible time mm -hmm. we're not worried that you know how much is the lead time to raise that capital versus the timeline to do the acquisition so we've got ready cash we can deploy it instantly mm. understood so even though there is you're saying that even though there is short term debt you intentionally want to keep cash just because it's more readily available and yeah and then we we are, we are having a couple of opportunities Obviously, we will need it. Okay. So, you know, if I repay it uh, now and then try to raise it again later, it's a long, lengthy process, and a lot of paperwork and long, lengthy process. Exciting. So, uh, this revenue guidance, any capex that you intend to do, like capacity expansion, because you said no, we are already see we are working at about sixty percent capacity. Okay. So, for the next about hundred crores uh, growth jump, we don't see any uh, major capex required, okay. uh, other in terms of maybe some toolings or some some. assembly line uh, putting in so no really major capex required mm. then do you plan to take debt or issue more equity if we look at a, uh, the next stage of uh, a larger uh, acquisition so we have never been uh, uh, looking at acquisitions uh, debt heavy mm. you know it will always be a mix of equity and debt mm. which is a sustainable model where we are not putting too much load on um, the interest repayments and we are not diluting uh, at the same time too much also no so we are always going to find a balance between the two okay understood so like to take it into 900 crores is it right to say that there might be more debt at the same time more equity dilution like raising more debt and equity dilution so there would be some uh, uh, you know equity that would need to raise uh, from the market and there would be a, a debt raise also to go for that acquisition understood it would be uh, pointed to that acquisition itself In what areas, if I may ask, what areas are you looking for acquisition? Existing so we, uh, no, we are open. Like I said, it has to be fuel agnostic, okay. and we are open to different areas uh, of acquisition. We are open to different geographies of acquisition. We have looked at a couple of also, uh, so we are still evaluating. There is no fixed. Uh, you know, we are taking it as it comes. We are taking the industry movement as it comes. So we are pretty fluid in that way. You know. From what I understand, uh, your grandfather started this business in around 1959 59 and then um, start from just from scratch build it up and then now you're the third generation the need was passed on to your father wow. then now you're the third generation but you are executive director so what role are you playing in this entire landscape and then uh, like why 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 aren't you the ceo no so uh, at one point of time to get to this scale and stuff we decided at you no know, you have to professionalize the business from a family business we had to professionalize it so in, uh, we in 2018 we onboarded a professional ceo but the road to professionalization started uh, about 2 or 3 years before that we had to get a plants ready we had to get the basic infrastructure in tune to attract uh, talent uh, that would you know join with us for the long term for the organization and uh, you know the ceo came on board then we made all changes within the organization uh, we onboarded a lot of new talent into the organization uh, 
So from a hands-on approach of, um, you know, so managing um, technical and the sales and product, it's, it's virtually impossible. You can't grow and do that at the same time. Uh, so uh, we decided to professionalize. So all the plants have their own plant heads. We have the full organization structure. We have a CFO, we have CS, uh, CEO. Uh, and uh, going forward, we might you know have to have two, three more levels of people to handle uh, multiple of the ventures that we are doing. Uh, so yeah, that's been the, the roadmap to transition. So my role into this right now is more on the strategy point of view and engineering point of view, where, uh, you know, mergers, acquisitions, looking out for new technologies. Uh, and on in the in this process, you know, we are a great place to work certified with multiple badges, uh, right from innovation to best workplaces to best auto, auto component workplaces. That was a big acquisition we got. Uh, it's a good, uh, we do lots of uh, efforts for building culture within the organization. So we are trying to use a more holistic approach towards uh, uh, growing. Uh, uh, not just from a, we're not just growing in numbers, we're growing uh, culturally in a holistic way also, you know. So my role more into the strategic M&A uh, and uh, engineering. And of course, uh, we're all there together, you know, we discuss on a daily basis, but on the execution side of it, now I'm almost hands out of the business. So, like, you know, to put in a very blatant way, no one will say we are unprofessionally run. So everyone says we are professionally run. But is this mean that you are not taking care of the daily operations? Yeah. You're not very involved. No. Not for that, you have a CEO. Yes. Okay. But for the, like, the strategic vision, like five years, what do we do? Two years, what will be the challenges? All this, like a director, executive director takes care of. Yes. Is this correct? Yes. We do it as a team. Okay. So uh, we have the board, then we have my father who's chairman and managing director, then myself. And then at the right point, we get the CEO also involved in it uh, because you know ultimately it will boil down to operations from there. So, uh, you know, it starts from there. And then, so there are a lot of uh, activities, you know, when you do an acquisition, before you do an acquisition. So that's a lot of time consuming uh, activity of space. Uh, that's where the whole setup helps to, you know, take care of the regular uh, running of the business where you can focus on the next uh, leap of growth. So strategy that the directors take care of such as uh, yourself yeah. and you got the CEO to take care of the daily activities and that's what we call professionally managed company. Yeah. From 2018 you went that route. Yes. Awesome. Very generic question. The industry uh, last question promise. Uh, so you, I think it's mentioned that 20, there are in 1,000 people, only 29 own a vehicle in India compared to like 500, 580 in the US for 1,000 people. Uh, so this sector, do you see it as a very nascent stage or is it that because of cultural differences, we cannot compare to markets? And first, and just an extension, we have seen in 2008, uh, automobile, the industry kind of, you know, it, it went through some turbulent times, there were like a 20% dip in automobile sales. And then in 2014, 2015 time, there was another dip. And in 2018, we saw it peak. And then uh, it was only in 2022 that we, 2023, that we reached the peak that we had achieved in 2018. So what I'm trying to say is 2008, 2015, 2018, 2020, sorry, COVID. And then now you know you don't know which next virus or next issue. So do you think that despite these turmoil, despite these issues, that industry can keep growing? And why, like, what is the... So, see, like you said, first, there's a gap in the number of vehicles owned in India versus uh, globally. That's predominantly due to the per capita income difference of uh, India versus globally. And that will stay till as long as the difference stays, you know. Uh, you'll still see a lot of new aspirants, uh, new jobs are opening. Uh, India has become a hotspot for you know, a lot of funding coming in. Uh, it, it's quite a self-sustained uh, economy in that stage. We've reached a very good level. Looking at our peers around us, our neighboring countries, I think we're the uh, only country that is rock solid at this point of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, obviously, there's going to be ups and dips in, uh, in the industry. Okay. You cannot uh, say that there'll be 100% growth at every point of time throughout the world. You know, yeah. uh, seeing ups and uh, uh, seeing a dip or seeing a crisis is, is going to become a norm for the auto industry mm -hmm. or any industry for that matter. You know, you cannot just, or any time, there's no point that you sit back and say, okay, everything's good and I'm relaxed. You know, it's, there's, you have to be on your foot, you have to be on the ball every time to, you know, because you don't know when the next challenge is going to come, from which corner it's going to come mm -hmm. in. Okay. So we 
so that's why we are looking at um, uh, looking at a geographical uh, presence you know so if there is a dip in a particular geography it's counted by the other geography if there is a dip in some geography it's counted by some other geography so split by uh, product type split by geographical locations uh, uh, split by <clears throat> sectors so that's how we are trying to mitigate the risk that we see of any ups and downs you know it will at least balance out in that because like uh, most of the companies you speak to whether it is in banking whether it, if it is in like steel for forging uh, they are saying that every two years every two and a half years there will be challenges okay. now uh, like there will be 30 percent 20 percent fall there's nothing we can do about it we just anticipate be pessimist be optimist sometimes and then just wave through it uh, and yes like you rightly said like there are companies there are countries that are facing recession there are countries that are blooming right now it's not like the entire globe is going on one straight path or on the same path i might say it's on different paths at different times but that's why like for example is, is it right for me to assume let's say the automobile is slowing down in uh, 2026 2027 but then the railways because it's a priority of the government that can you know keep at least some part of the business stable because you're going so uh, you know like we are uh, so in so many sectors okay so you'll have the farm sector which will continuously be doing the infrastructure sector which is uh, road highways making and stuff that's going to be a boom in india for the next at least 4 5 years you know that's not going to see a stop anyway the railways of course is going to go because of a huge population you know we still have a lot of uh, things to map a lot of upgradation that's going to be take place uh, over there that will set off some of the automotive uh, yeah. downtrend. Plus, that's only India we're talking. Geographically, we're trying to you know, offset it by going to different geographies to you know, ride their wave of um, ups. And of course, with it, it will come their waves of downs also, where the India will take over from there. You know. So rather than putting all the eggs in one basket, yeah. we're trying to you know, have a larger portfolio. And uh, from a company's uh, perspective, if I add products and add it, I'm already re mitigating the risk of a downtrend. Like if it was just cables and the industry goes slow, my, but if it's cables, sensors, uh, uh, tire mobility, uh, uh, something, you know, so something will take care of something uh, going forward somewhere. Understood. Awesome. Great. I think uh, this is a easy, because it's not too technical, I would say, uh, control cables and the new areas that you're going into, you explained it very well. And I really appreciate you for your time you've taken. Oh, thank you so much. Anyway. Right.